I was really pleased to be invited to look at the whole big theme of maker culture was my brief um, and here are my guests to help me do that. I do feel a little bit like I'm on question time or something like that. Um, and so I think just to start off, um, I'd like, I've asked each of them just to um, introduce themselves and say a little bit about their experiences and activities in um, particularly in sort of engaging other people in making what their, yeah, what their experiences are of doing that so we get a sense of who's here and then we'll kind of broaden it out into a discussion. So I'm feeling like starting this way, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's <fine>. cool. <laughs> so Hi just, everyone, yeah. um, I'm Tom, my name's Tom Tobias. Um, I am a designer and maker in the loosest sense of the word probably, as in I'm crap at both, but I try. Um, what I am a little bit better at is um, providing space for other people to make. So I run an organisation called Makerversity, which is based at Somerset House in London, um, and recently uh, also in Amsterdam as well. Um, Makerversity is built on the principle of providing everything you need as a, a maker, a startup business who makes something tangible, whether that's uh, digital or physical or both or edible or musical is fine as well. We're pretty broad as far as that's concerned. Um, we have about, I think about 350 businesses based with us now across our two sites. Um, and the kind of deal is you get access to space to work, a community of people who are doing uh, similar things to you and very different things to you as well um, and access to all the kind of tools, kit and spaces that are really really hard to get a hold of when you're at an early stage. So not dissimilar to your average maker space but more focused around uh, full-time startup businesses. And the trade-off is the kind of versity bit of maker versity if you like. If you are based from our space you get a great deal in a great location and the trade-off is you have to give up some of your time every month to helping us uh, run learning programmes for young people to get into uh, what uh, I guess we would in marketing bullshit terms call the careers of the future. Um, so we sort of use the expertise of all the different people that work uh, within our space across all of their fields as a, as a kind of faculty and we run things with people like the Prince's Trust, um, formerly Kids Company, not anymore sadly. Uh, but lots of youth organisations and schools to, to kind of bring interesting uh, emerging technologies, emerging practice to young people um, and kind of plug that gap that either expensive uh, university fees or just general lack of knowledge around that stuff uh, doesn't, isn't filled by, by parents or teachers. So that's me. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, uh, I'm Tamar Millen. Uh, I am neither a maker nor an academic, um, but I have been involved in... I suppose we're going to discuss whether it is a maker culture for the last uh, 16, 17 years. Um, I was part of the team that started Access Space here in Sheffield, uh, which was uh, very different then to what it is now. Um, I don't know if there's anybody here from the Access Space team. I can't see. Yay! <laughs> oh, yes, there's <laughs> Um, and when we started, it was just basically internet, it was web to web. Uh, we, were we were teaching people <coughs> how to build the web themselves um, using recycled. Uh, hardware and uh, free and open source software which was uh, considered to be a bit anarchic back then, 1999-2000. Um, uh, and since then I have worked in an awful lot of uh, arts, uh, crafts, participatory environments. Uh, I use the word participatory quite loosely but basically my, my beef has been about making um, particularly arts and tech and digital open to people who wouldn't necessarily uh, get that opportunity or who don't think that they are of a sort of elite that can get into it and that's that's a big part of um, of what my job is not now then now my job is to coordinate year of making here in Sheffield um, and I've been doing that since uh, this time last year I was employed and it's a uh, quite an exciting uh, year it will going to turn it around we're going to become city of makers in march which is quite exciting as well and the um the idea is that we have this mass inheritance in sheffield there is something about the city that um attracts makers to the city but also um is people use phrases like in the dna of the city i don't particularly like that particular phrase but i there's something about this city and the way that it's set up that means making is within the traditions all the way through. And um, 
that's what we're trying to do is sort of get to the back to the core of what this city actually is in terms of um, a, a wider narrative and yes I've now lost my thread there you go <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm doing now excellent and I feel you. a bit odd being on a panel with people who actually make <laughs> okay yeah, for my presentation I really need a couple of photos um, I hope you guys can see something with this light um, Media Lab, Media Lab Prado um, is a is a thank you. Um, is what we call a laboratory of citizenship for a production of an experimentation of cultural projects. Yeah, and this is something for me hard to explain without without an example. So I would will, will like to talk just about one thing we just made in Media Lab to try to explain what we mean. Yeah. This is the idea of I mean by citizenship laboratory. This is just a random uh, woman who came to Media Lab and asked me if we have some exhibitions uh, to see paintings. And then I opened the computer and gave her Lifecode Lab, which is a website where you can program and live coding some graphics. And I told her what we do in Media Lab is not uh, showing uh, pictures from someone else, but to to teach you how to create your own your own pictures. Yeah. So, for example, last year. Uh, an association of music of Spain came to Media Lab to tell us to bring a piece of music made in Austria. The piece is called Expansion of the Universe and it needs 200 loudspeakers. So we told them that because we are not a diffusion center, we are a production center, we proposed them to, to build the loudspeakers in Media Lab, yeah? With the idea of using them afterwards. And what happened is, because the loudspeakers, they are built on wood, and this wood would be cut with a laser cut, and we have this, then we made 200 loudspeakers on a collaborative workshop. So I asked people if they wanted to help me to buy this, uh, to build this, sorry. So they came to Media Lab three weeks and they were building these loudspeakers for the installation. Then there was one week of hanging the whole system, and then the Austrians, they brought this uh, prototype of how to manage so many channels on a single device, yeah? Those are 108 uh, MP3 players with an Amplify uh, system, and then we connect the whole 200 loudspeakers on this. The idea with this final photo is that uh, we had a presentation of expansion of the universe, but then after that there was a month where another composer from Media Lab could make also music for the system. So we make an open call and the local people uh, use the system to make their own their own things. And one of the things that happened at the end was uh, an amateur group of um, Gamelan ensemble, they came with a, big, a piece for Gamelan and electroacoustic music, yeah? and then they played this at Media Lab. So this is more or less what we do in Media Lab. We are a production, of, uh, we are a production center, people come to Media Lab to do things, and they are all related to culture in a very broad way. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Ryan. Hi. Uh, good, good evening. Um, my name's Ryan, and I have an organisation called Bird and Bee. <laughs> As in the birds and the bees, the process of creation, really. Um, which all came about in 1999, so it's 18 years on now. Uh, we have a creative agency, and we make, produce, design all sorts of different installations and uh, participate projects uh, across the city and across the country really as, uh, as well as uh, graphic design and various other bits but for me it all started really when um, uh, I took apart a lawnmower when I was 10 years old and um, myself and my father we rebuilt we had, to, we had to make a piston and a cylinder to get it back to work and it took about two weeks to do but it came back to life and I was just astounded that we could do that on a tiny little lathe in the shed down, down in the garden. Um, and ever since then, really, I've just been obsessed with taking things apart, putting them back together again, seeing how they work. So materials are where it's at for me, really. It's all to do with materials and getting to know what that material is capable of, its strengths and its limitations, and the way that it can be used, and uh, mixing that up, really. So. For me, it's all about fundamentals. It's all about the the, uh, the materials itself, and then the skills that you can apply and the tools that you can use with those materials to produce different things. 
Um, so I've got an example of uh, such a thing down at the Millennium Galleries tonight, which um, I'm hoping you're going to come and have a play with, um, come and do some drawing. And that, this particular one deals with, um, with three fundamentals, which is uh, gravity, friction, and time. And the idea of this project really was to give adults and children who don't experience making a way in to understanding um, how things work, just how things work, on a really simple platform, a really simple, simplified way of accessing it. So um, for this particular one, we're talking about brass and wood, and that's it. And very simple, a bit of copper thrown in as well. Um, very simple, but how we use our input to create um, using those three fundamentals, basically. So it becomes, like a, it becomes like a learning experiment, and it becomes something that you can engage with on a very personal level, pu purely by experimenting, purely by changing settings, simplifying, uh, trying different directions, things like that. And what it teaches you about those three fundamentals, it also teaches you about how you feel about those as well. So it gives, it gives something back at the same time, I personally think. And I think when you make, when you sit at a bench with, it might be a vice or a tool or whatever it is, it's not really, uh, it's, you're in the moment, it allows you to just sit and be in that moment, whatever you're doing, if it's with a soldering iron or whatever, but it allows you to um, be the next element in the process in the, in, of what you're creating. But before all of that, it's the idea and it's where you want to go with it and asking those, asking those questions for me are really important. I make a living from making, making my own things and at times it's been a real struggle through my life and in other times it's been fantastic, it's been brilliant and it's kind of, you know, you're riding a wave of, of your ideas really. Um, so I feel very fortunate, very lucky to do that. I'm not necessarily, you know, I started with a, an illustration degree but that's as far as my academia goes. But I find myself sort of constantly self-educating, um, reading the things that I think I need to know about in order to further the next idea. And, and to me, that's it's a big passion. So that's where the passion is. Um, what part that has in society, we'll get to in a sec, I guess, won't we? Yeah. Yeah. Nice, nicely segue. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I should briefly say something about my background. So I'm a, um, a designer and maker and researcher. Um, primarily working in the area of knitting. So I've designed and made collections of knitwear and sold them to people. I've done lots of projects where I facilitate and encourage other people to knit. Um, so that's my kind of sphere of making, I suppose. Um, so in order to kind of frame this discussion, I gave my panellists a heads up a week or two ago um, that I was going to use a couple of quotes from um, some papers from a, a book called Critical Making that was edited by Garnet Hertz. And if anyone doesn't know this, it's a super, super kind of resource of really interesting stuff. It's all available for free online. Um, and so I've got one very kind of positive, um, making is amazing and will change the world quote, and one which is a more kind of cautionary, um, you know, more cautionary note. So I think I'm going to go for the positive one first. Um, and I'll read it and then I would be, I think it'd be really interesting if anybody on the panel who wants to could respond and say, um, could kind of respond to it and say how much you see this happening in your experiences. So this first one is from a paper by um, Amanda Williams and Joshua Tannenbaum. Um, where they're talking about making and what its kind of potential is in the world. Um, and they say, many practices of making can be considered a sort of everyday resistance, not just to a consumerist culture, but also to a political system increasingly controlled by corporate interests. Let me say that bit again. C increasingly controlled by corporate interests just being very current here, um, and difficult for normal people to influence directly. So this is, you know, making isn't just the satisfactions of the thing that you've got in front of you that Ryan just talked about, but it's resistance and it's very political and, you know, that has very kind of big, significant um, resonances, I think. 
Has anyone got any experiences? Do, do you see this when you engage people in making? Well, it's, uh, it's happened in culture for centuries, hasn't it? We've had art and design movements for centuries. Yeah, we can go back and look at all of those. I mean, you probably know more about that than I do. I'm not, I don't have the academic knowledge, but I know we've had movements and things come in waves, don't they? I think. Um, and maybe they are sort of mini resistances, but they also probably answer a need at the time as well, whether that's a greater need on society or an individual need. Um, because where I grew up, which is farmland basically in the middle of nowhere, every, anything that people made or, or made were, were tool like really. They had a, a reason to make them, there was a, there was a need mm -hmm. as opposed to I'm going to make a piece of pottery because I'm sick of buying them from China, for instance. Yeah, it would be, it's a completely different way of looking at it, isn't mm -hmm. it, for me anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tom, the, the young people that come to things that make adversity. Do you, do you see how, how, do you feel like it changes how people's mindsets? Is it politicised? Is, is it kind of accidentally politicised? Does it change people's behaviour? I, I can't say honestly that I see many people, young mm. or not, that put that kind of thought into it. Mm. Um, I not well. That's probably not true. Actually, I guess, I guess the young people know. Uh, most 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 young people want to come into something, and, and sure, if they're up for learning stuff, that's cool. But it's quite a personal experience. I think I don't think that there's a wider context that they necessarily mm -hmm. bring to that. Some of the most interesting businesses that work from our space are, are very different to that, I suppose. So, um, unmade who have kind of um, taken an industrial knitting machine and essentially reprogrammed it so that you can produce one-off pieces of knitwear at the same speed as mass manufacture. And that was a direct challenge to the kind of make in China in big bulk, ship to the UK and sell fast fashion. So the starting point of that was what can we do to disrupt mm -hmm. that particular mm -hmm. supply chain. So, um, but I, again, I think we, we, like, we do have a tendency to glamorise that as if it's something new. Mm -hmm. um, and I would absolutely agree that you know most of these most of these things are not new and have been based on necessity for a very long time. Uh, we've kind of probably got to the point where necessity drives a lot less activity in our day-to-day -day lives than it used to. And so that's got us thinking that we're all, you know, somehow way more conceptually brilliant than our predecessors, <laughs> but in natural fact, it's just because mm -hmm. we've got a bit of breathing space probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very similar, yeah. It's, it's exactly what Ryan said, yeah, making's been going on for so long and maybe it's just about where the um, spotlight shines mm -hmm. um, and that's a little bit about what we're saying that in this city as well it goes back centuries in this city making as a as a city-based activity mm -hmm. and what we're saying is that the making changes but it's where the spotlight shines and what you make that mm -hmm. is the thing so it's not actually a direct political but it can yeah i wanted to point this this last sentence that increasingly those projects that are were born as a critic of the capitalism or something like this. They are step by step taken by by companies. And before in the morning, I talk about auto fabricantes, which is the people who was making this hand. And they are every week or every month, they come, someone comes to them and and asks them to to buy the design or to collaborate with some mm -hmm. industry to make some kit one day that you can sell to families to to make this project. Yeah, and they have to fight also with this. With these, um, these proposals to try to stay um, as they are, yeah, as a free group of people trying to to give a free solution to a problem. And I must say that there, there are many young people in this group. Just to tell that mm. there is hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd add to that as well. I'd say that human beings, as human beings, we have an innate sort of need to make. For me, it's like it's, it's, it's sort of hand-eye, brain-hand thing that we have to sort of fulfil in ourselves somehow, which is why we're so um, rampant in the world, I think. You know, that we just create, create, make, make, make. We've got this innate sort of built-in thing within all of us that has the desire to sort of want and have to do that to some level, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that that sort of drives it, really, which is why probably we're so successful as a, as a race, because we, we find the most amazing problem solving techniques, ways to use uh, materials that are ways to find materials. And there's always a there's always something to play with if you like, yeah? Mm. Um, and we can't really stop ourselves either. 
And I think that's probably why we're so saturated with it all at the mm -hmm. moment as well. Mm -hmm. But we do live in it right now. Of course, everything has changed since the sort of the uh, mid '90s, anyway, because we can we can share findings so easily. You know, if you wanted to become a designer at the age of 18 now and go to university, you know, everything that you look at out there, it's all been done a million times over in a, in a million different ways, and it, uh, I imagine it would be quite petrifying to begin that journey right now mm -hmm. because everything has been done and there's the thing that I always think about is how the hell do people get the time and the money to make these things you know <laughs> I always find it f phenomenal I really do mm -hmm. um, but that's where passion comes in of course mm -hmm. and that's where you create your own space in order to do that because we have this innate need to find a way to do that mm -hmm. I think, yeah. I think that is an interesting point and I, I think for some people passion alone for many people, passion mm. alone uh, or ha having the desire to do something mm. is not enough, that they actually can't carve that time. And that that you often hear from people exactly like mm. me on panels mm. like this, which is like the epitome of middle class, right? So like mm. I had the time and the money when I grew up to explore doing these things. Mm. My parents mm. encouraged creative mm. activity. Yeah, right. I went to university and, mm. and had a nice time doing that. Mm. I came out of uni, started my own business, it failed, I moved back in with mum and dad mm, because I mm. could. So like, I've always had that space yeah, to do that. Okay. Um, Whereas I, I probably come from the opposite of that. Mm. And uh, yeah, I've had a tenacity, I can't stop, you know, I really can't <laughs> stop. It's something in me, somehow, that I'd rather do that than anything else. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Ultimately. I think when there's outside pressures as well, then yeah. that becomes a different thing. You yeah. know, if yeah. you then have to support a family, which you Absolutely. have done, and what are the pressures mm. on that, and where does that time go? Yeah, so things have then, to work in know, a different so, way. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's again beautifully mm. leading into my second <laughs> quote. Anybody would I'll give you a good pat on the back later. <laughs> okay, so the, the second quote I've chosen is by a guy called Chris Csikszentmihalyi. Um, and he writes what is quite a balanced paper about the role of making in contemporary life. I'm picking out his kind of devil's advocate statement here, so I'm conscious I, I, I may be sort of misrepresenting him by cherry picking a bit. But I think it is really, it's the culmination of his um, article. And he says, what is called making in North America and Europe is frankly a luxurious pastime of wealthy people who rightly recognise that their lives are less full because they are alienated from material culture, almost all of which is products produced by corporate interests. Sadly, rather than address the problem, makers develop a hobby that solves the symptom for them, but if anything, slightly strengthens the disease. <laughs> it makes you just think, what, what, what are we doing? <laughs> Um, any any responses to that? To that? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go on. Um, I think it's a, for me. There's a wider thing about what is making, mm -hmm. um, and where where that particular quote is aimed at uh, is perhaps is what is identified as maker culture. Who has defined maker culture is a big thing for me. Um, you know, and you know. Did the only bit of research I did before this panel was to look on Wikipedia and go, is make culture a thing? Yes. Um, and well, so, yeah. you know, yeah. and, you know it, is it, it a thing? Yeah. And, and who, who's written that? Who's decided that? Who's, you know, and that, yeah. that's the big thing for me because as Ryan rightly said at the beginning, making's been going on for ages, mm -hmm. you and that, know, and that's, and that's the key. So, so what is make a culture that he's referring to? Yeah. Um, and also, yes, I agree. And also, no, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and or both. Yeah. I think, like, as soon as you start talking about making with a capital M, mm -hmm. then you're, what you're doing is making a point of differentiation from the average person. And yeah. that, so in, in that sense, I thoroughly agree with that, right? Yeah. The last thing that we need is more ways to differentiate ourselves from other people. Mm. Um, so make a culture, the maker movement, whatever you want to call it, like are you a maker is such a weird question yeah. to your point exactly which is well of course everyone is like I born with it, right yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> and like that can manifest itself in million yeah. a million different ways if you if you're like amazing at making lasagna like that doesn't make you inferior to someone who's great with arduino and so this kind of making with a capital m thing is like a bugbear of mine it just mm. come on i mean like you know you you can do these things someone else can do these yeah. things and, and it's much it's a much happier world if we're all mm -hmm. like not judging each other for whether or not we're part yeah. of a group or not. I mean, I see it with um, yarn crafts, you know, <laughs> as I don't like to call them, um, <laughs> being kind of separated off from, you know, hard techy kind of making. And then you sort of see sometimes like Fab Lab maker spaces like, oh, 
where are all the women? Maybe we've got some textile <laughs> things. Maybe they would come. And it's just like this sort of weird cult cultural difference and maybe yeah. it's to do with how that's set up. I don't know. But then even within within yarn crafts, as I've decided to now call them. Is that the capital Y? Yeah, there's, 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 yeah. Um, You know, there's a, there's a pecking order and there's a hierarchy. You know, hand knitters look down on machine knitters and it's just kind of this... Where are all of these borders coming from? What, what's that? About? I think, like, if making is innate in everybody, then so is differentiation and, like, yes. trying to get ahead, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, so, like, yeah. there's always going to be people who are trying to climb up that thing. Yeah. I don't know how yeah. helpful it is to, to, uh, to talk about it too yeah. much. You know, I don't know. Maybe just ignore it. Yeah. Yes. Sure. I'd like to open up the conversation if anyone has any um, questions or comments <laughs> about what we're discussing. Are we just fooling ourselves? Are we just a little clique that likes making things and couldn't believe anybody would vote to get out of Europe and couldn't believe anybody would vote for Trump? I, did, I wrote down filter bubble in my um, yeah. thoughts about what, you know, this, this conversation. Yeah, I sometimes wonder, like, are we, are we getting um, seduced by our own hype of, like, the, the, the joy of making? Mm. We must evangelise and spread it to people. Well, I think the, yeah. the reference to like um, accentuating the disease or whatever it was is, is exactly to that point, which is I would say that like that I, I really do think that, that almost everybody enjoys or would enjoy creating something with their hands when if given the opportunity. The more we believe our own hype and talk in groups like this, the further away most people are from actually reaching that as a, as a thing to do. So, um, yeah, it's like... I, I think we are fooling ourselves in, in some respects, but uh, that doesn't mean that we're fooling ourselves in the sense that we're the only people that like it, I guess. Yeah. I think we, we, um, I, I sort of embrace it in enthusiasm, because it's what I've been doing all my life, and suddenly it's, it's hit. <laughs> but I don't know whether it's just a phase. Um, I don't know whether there are still 95% you know, of the rest of the country isn't even interested. I don't know. I think we will continue to make, we will continue to make extraordinary things and we will continue to enjoy it. It's about where the spotlight is uh, and it's about who's shining that spotlight as well. Um, so who, who are the people behind that are, that are emphasising maker culture um, with a capital M and, and why and what is their motivation to do that? Um, you know, my family have been making apart from me, obviously, um, <laughs> for a long time. You know, my, my partner was a steel worker. Um, he could never find him. He's always in the cellar making stuff. The stuff he's making now is considered to be hip, as you would just call it. It's not what, it, you know, he was making the same stuff 10, 15 years ago, and it wasn't then. Um, it is about the trends within a wider yeah. aspect, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if we do... I can't even say the word fetishize it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. We are in danger of it becoming no longer trendy and therefore no longer uh, exploring actually what the benefits can be for a wider society. Um, and also, I think that that definition of what fits into maker culture is quite difficult as well. Well, um, that's the issue I know, have with yeah. it as well because make it, make it, making lasagna all the way yeah. to all the way to precision precision Swiss watches. Which, if you talk about making, now they're makers, mm. they're, they are the makers, aren't they, really? But it's everything in between, isn't yeah. it? And that's the thing. They're, you can't define it into a, into a popular culture, I don't think, no. in that respect, because it's the steel workers producing, it's, the, it's, it's every it's person theater, in the chain, it's isn't music, it? It's music, it's, it's the whole sort of absolutely. gamut of it. Yeah, and these are people's lives and yeah. their livelihoods as well, and that's the other point, that to fetishise or to um, sort of position it as something... Uh, of the now is I find ridiculous I, I find it absolutely ridiculous really I'll be honest with you there's no there's no need and, th and there's no reason to do that either mm. so I find that quote twaddle <laughs> <laughs> that's our that's our review mm. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, going to say I, something? yeah I agree that um, making is something that has been happening in societies for the whole history of humanity and it had always happened inside a community. So what has changed maybe with this make culture now is that a capitalism way of thinking about it is you, you make your own thing alone at your home mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah? You, again, you buy your kit and that doesn't make you like, actually a, a maker. We think, as a, when we were thinking about this before I came here, that the community behind a project 
is what make a project really uh, uh, important important for yeah. everyone yeah? yeah and as long as you are doing something that is going to connect you to other people needs then maybe you are in the right track and if you're doing something that all just interested you is interesting for you and maybe makes you better and maybe open doors to things that you never thought absolutely but it's yeah. so that's, that's really interesting yeah, yeah it is because i think uh, if i'm understanding you right what you're essentially saying is that make a culture sort of in some respects talks about a type of making that is a means to its own end and you know you're doing it for doing its sake rather than there being a driving reason behind it mm. and actually like some level of human interaction or, or a, a sense of trying to get somewhere by doing something is, is what drives making meaningful making I suppose. Well if maker culture can um, do one thing if it can share knowledge if it can help to use that in a sort of educational way um, through these communities just like you're saying and through shared, through shared experiences or similar experiences then I wouldn't have so much of a, a problem with it I don't think because that's where the beauty is it's the sharing of knowledge mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. especially to the generations that's coming as well and I think we our generation my generation um, <laughs> was kind of um, at risk of losing that to an extent because we were pre-internet and on top of internet and here we are sort of post-internet and um, we're well not post-internet but so far down the line that yeah. it's become you know yeah. overwhelming for most people hasn't it so for my children's generation for instance i have a 16 year old daughter who um has actively embraced all that culture as you can imagine they're in danger i think of um not fear seeing the point of using their hands to make things as much. So, you know, getting in the, in the kitchen and making lasagna is the starting point, isn't it? It really is. Mm. So if there are projects like the, one that, the ones that you've been doing and the Arduino projects, things that you can share experiences with, it, now that's worth growing, isn't it? I think mm -hmm. that's the great thing that can come out of it. Yeah, I think yeah. The, the sharing thing is so important. So um, it's just making me think of, in my research, I worked with a group of knitters and was encouraging them to design for themselves rather than following patterns and this was something that they'd expressed an interest in doing this is why they'd come to take part in this um, thing that i was doing and i found that they had all of these ideas about like who was allowed to design and that they weren't allowed to design because mm. they were just ordinary knitters mm. and so it's another thing about definitions mm. and mm. Uh, permissions um that they thought oh I'm just a knitter and you know obviously you've got all kinds of cultural things making just a knitter be a, a statement that you would you would use um, and then suddenly when I gave them permission by being in my creative studio so it felt like they were in a creative place and kind of said let's let's have a go let's play um, is that I'm getting permission by by being here and it's it's a one of the quotes something like it's permission that you you have but you don't realize you have until someone kind of shows it mm. and by making together in a group they gained more confidence in what they produced there's a big thing in homemade clothes you make something at home by yourself you slave over it you finish it and you think that looks a bit rubbish <laughs> <laughs> it goes to the back of the wardrobe if you do things i think that that community kind of sharing mm. is really important mm. for um all kinds of exchanges yeah, of knowledge yeah, including yeah. celebrating the thing the, the useful things that you've made Mm. Maker culture seems to me that it's a lot to do with um, there's, a, there's a, a sort of a electronics meets the physical sort of side of things, which quite interests me. And I don't, I don't really know much about electronics. I've had a go here and there, but it seems to me that um, again, that's sort of passion led. It's sort of trying to recreating some uh, a physical uh, movement or motion or something that is exists already, but sort of, um, yeah, making it electronically. And just that as in itself is, is, is such a, a task, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it becomes about problem solving, doesn't it? Like most of these things, like design really is problem solving, mm -hmm. isn't it, when it comes down to it. Whereas making, you can, you know, you can sculpt, you can make for the making sake as well, can't you? Mm -hmm. To be in the moment, and to just enjoy the process of the material. Mm -hmm. Do we have a question? Is there a relationship to hackathon? Nip, nip bombing. Isn't that yeah, 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 yarn yeah. bombing. Yeah, it does. Yarn bombing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, definitely. Maybe. Um, can, 
Sorry. All sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, my, I mean, my work's about trying to open up the fashion system and indi- individual knitted garments. Yeah. So you hack, you hack big things through hacking physical yeah, things. The yeah, the arm bombing. No, I, I suppose the idea is you're kind of messing with the, the expectations of the yeah, yeah the, mm. the built yeah. environment around you. What's yeah. the arm bombing? <laughs> um, um, co- covering things outdoors with knitting. There was a series of them in Sheffield, and um, people had knitted around lamp posts mm. perfectly. So they they must have done it there, for instance. Yeah, they usually haven't. Really? No. Yeah. Oh, that's which just like, which, is why, <laughs> which is why I disapprove. Right. Oh, okay. So it's not quite. Like, they're all night. Like, yeah. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a stickler yeah. for seamless, and so I want yeah. to sell oh, it Yeah. Okay. Off okay. So you've got really. a closer inspection. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, on a smaller scale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm quite interested in that chick sent me a quote that you had. And it's very cynical, it's kind of a massive yeah. quote. But, but looking at it from one perspective, you might see that the mega culture has become a you know, multi million dollar industry. Mm-hmm. It's an yeah. industry now. And not only that, it's also fashionable. Um, and it connects to maybe hipster culture. People yeah, are making it does. Beer, people are making beards, I thought you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Which beard, beard knitting. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, keep going. And so on. So, so, so that's, uh, yeah. I mean, from his perspective, where he stands and looks at it, he can throw such a statement. Mm. But from the other perspective, I think we can see that um, we are living in more technology-sized society. We have these computers and we want to make music and suddenly we use some software and we find that the software is constraining us and then we think how can I break out of these constraints and one way of doing that is just to start coding, making our own software and that's maker culture so yes, hacker culture I think you know, yeah, the main yeah, software okay. is a maker culture um, I don't see any difference between you know, play or code mm-hmm. it's the same mm-hmm. hacker manifesto yeah so, so it's from, from taking that political side to have the culture. Yeah, exactly that. And, and, and so, so we have these devices. We, we are all consumers of stuff, you know, mm-hmm. phones and laptops and stuff. But at the same time, we start to think, hang on a minute. I want to have a little bit of control here. I want to break up. I want to open up and, and make my own thing with it. So um, in a way, it's a political thing. and and. Perhaps um, it's a, it's a, yeah it's a need in people to do this and, and the industry the, the you know the Arduino makers and so on they're just uh, supplying you know the demand and there's perhaps nothing wrong with that I mean we mm. are in a capitalistic society it's the nature of our, our society I mean economies yeah. are, are such a massive part of it aren't they mm. um, so kits are cheaper for one right. So to build your own PC will cost you about, what, 150 quid or something, or you can go and buy a MacBook for two grand or whatever. There's a choice you can make there, isn't there? There's an aesthetic choice, and there's a convenience choice, and there's a financial choice in that, isn't there? There's an assumption that people are time rich. Absolutely. Um, and that very yeah. much comes from that sort of uh, middle class thing that you were saying, that there are people are time rich and therefore have the ability to yeah. learn how to put together mm-hmm. their own PC, yeah. learn how to make things, Absolutely. rather than just discovering their time. Mm. And I think that's a big thing for me, is that not everybody has that time mm. to be able to do that learning. Um, and a lot of that comes from where you are placing your time. Yes. And, and a big part of that for me is about, particularly the position of women in society, yeah. is a, they're expected to do an awful mm. lot in terms of looking after other people's time, that therefore yeah. Yeah. that doesn't yeah. get eaten up. But it's that whole sort of pram in the hallway argument yeah. through literature, the whole sort of idea of that. And it's it's having a balance, of course, as well yeah. with all of that, isn't it? Yeah. That's, okay. that's the thing. <laughs> I'm going to draw to a close because I have my baby in a pushchair waiting <laughs> outside. <laughs> Brilliant, so it's a perfect, perfect end. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>